Uh, welcome to the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum. My name is Leon C. Fuentes, and I am the Academic Programs Coordinator here at the Education Division of the Museum. Um, today, we're very happy to present Courtney Martin, co-editor of the anthology Click, When We Knew We Were Feminists, leading a panel of pretty phenomenal women uh, in a discussion of how they discovered feminism. So we're really hoping this will be a good conversation. So I'm gonna introduce Courtney uh, Martin and then uh, Ms. Martin will be introducing the rest of the panelists. <laughs> um, Courtney Martin is a writer, teacher, and speaker living in Brooklyn. Um, her first book, Perfect Girls, Starving Daughters, how the quest for perfection is harming young women led her to speak at over 50 colleges and universities across the nation. She's also an editor at Feministing.com, the most highly read feminist publication in the world, woo, and a <laughs> senior correspondent for the American Prospect. Um, she has had an ongoing collaboration here with the Sackler Center for several years and has moderated several panels. Uh, we're very, very happy to have her here, so thank you very much. Please help me welcome Courtney Martin. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for being here. It's very exciting to see that a panel on young feminism gets a crowd like this. Um, so I am going to introduce each of these talented people right before they talk, but I wanted to first give you a bit of an introduction um, about how Click came to be. Um, Courtney Sullivan, who's right here to my left, and I um, are friends, and she's a novelist, and she was writing a scene where she had to figure out she had a contemporary young woman character who was going to have her feminist Click moment. So Courtney decided, I'm going to email a bunch of my young feminist friends and say, what was your click moment to make sure this is kind of authentic and interesting? So what emerged was this email thread um, where people sort of owned up about, oh, it was the do this documentary film. Um, it was this you know, academic experience. It was um, you know, when I got raped. It was uh, when I saw, this is mine, someone wearing fishnet stockings, longer story, I'll explain later. So, so we read all of these threads, and I said to Courtney, I think we were having lunch at the time, and I was like, that was really interesting, because if we had sent that same email, for example, to a group of my mom's friends, I think we would have gotten a very, very different list. Um, and maybe we would have actually gotten some of the same items, uh, but it's sort of like expanded in terms of the entry points that people have to feminism. Um, and wouldn't it be cool to actually anthologize that in some way, create some sort of document that goes beyond our very exclusive email chain and, and helps people understand that the contemporary feminist movement is both incredibly diverse in terms of the way people engage it, different kinds of activism, writing, blogging, community organizing, um, changing institutions from the inside out, but also that, that that's mirrored by the way people come to feminism these days, that there are so many amazing different entry points. Um, so that's how it came about. We also want to pay homage to uh, the woman who really coined this idea of the feminist click moment. Does anyone know who has not read the anthology where that comes from? Anyone in the audience raise your hand? Really? <laughs> Come on, there were some Ms. Magazine readers in here from the 70s. I see you ladies. All right, so, so Jane, Jane O'Reilly in 1971 wrote an essay in Ms. Magazine about the click moment. And I want to read just a little bit of that to you to give you a sense of how different it might be from what you're going to be hearing in a second. Um, so... Jane O'Reilly reclaimed the click for the ladies in her 1971 Ms. Magazine cover story entitled The Housewife's Moment of Truth. Not a lot of housewives on the stage, but you'll, you'll see that soon. Appearing in the inaugural issue, it opened with a group of women lying on the floor in Aspen. This is a quote, floating free and uneasy on the indoor-outdoor carpet, eyes closed, being led through the first phase of a workshop in approaching unisexuality. The women, quote, recognize the click of recognition, that, that parentheses of truth around a little thing that completes the puzzle of reality in women's minds, the moment that brings a gleam to our eyes and means the revolution has begun. 
The backdrop of O'Reilly's story is di distinctly early 70s, and the realizations that occur on that no doubt shag carpet seem somewhat fixed in time, too. One by one, the women O'Reilly describes realize that they can no longer tolerate the sexism all around. She writes, in Houston, Texas, a friend of mine stood and watched her husband step over a pile of toys on the stairs, put there to be carried up. Why can't you get this stuff put away, he mumbled. Click. You have two hands, she said, turning away. Last summer, I got a letter from a man who wrote, I do not agree with your last article, and I'm canceling my wife's subscription. <laughs> the next day, I got a letter from his wife saying, I am not canceling my subscription. Click. <laughs> last August, I was on a boat leaving an island in Maine. Two families were with me, and the mothers were discussing the troubles of cleaning up after a rental summer. Bob cleaned up the bathroom for me, didn't you, honey? She confided, gratefully patting her husband's knee. Well, what the hell, it's vacation, he said fondly. The two women looked at each other, and the queerest change came over their faces. I got up at 6 this morning to make the sandwiches for the trip home from this vacation, the first one said. So I wonder why I've thanked him at least six times for cleaning the bathroom. Click, click, click. Um, so this is sort of the, the 70s era version of what we try to do in our anthology. As you'll see, it sounds very, very different, but we wanted to express our gratitude to that article and to sort of this continuum of that conversation. The other really like modern wonderful thing is that we've become Facebook friends with Jane O'Reilly and so she like loves to comment on our stuff and like we're she's all buddies now. Click. So yeah, she's into clicks. So that's a, a great, um, a great tribute. Uh, in any case, what you're going to be hearing, so, so Courtney and I created this anthology, that's the punchline, right, um, with Seal Press and it, it's really, it was our attempt to as I said, represent the diversity of this movement and all the different ways in which um, women enter um, into it. And it was, it was incredible for us because we, we really weren't terribly proficient about getting the call for submissions out into the world because we'd never done this before. We posted on Feministing, et cetera, but we had a flood of amazing work. So the challenge was really narrowing it down to fit into this one book. I mean, there could be volumes of the ways in which um, young women and men are are entering this movement, but we're so proud of the work that's in here and the voices that are represented, and even more proud that um, three of them, four of them, counting court, are here today to to really give you a piece of their essay in their own voices. Um, and Dr. Sackler, who obviously endowed this center, specifically requested this panel and requested these voices because she read the anthology and was so moved by it. So she's actually ill today, so she couldn't be here, but. Um, that was uh, something that I was incredibly touched by for a woman who's such a hero of this movement to really hear these voices and say, I want to hear them myself in person was really exciting. Um, so we will start without further ado. We're definitely going to have time for questions and to really make this interactive, but we'll start out by hearing an excerpt from each of the essayists. Um, we're going to start with Miriam Perez, who is a writer, blogger, and reproductive justice activist. She's an editor at Feministing.com and the founder of RadicalDoula.com, which is a really awesome site if anyone hasn't checked it out. Um, her work has appeared in Bitch Magazine, The Nation, Alternet, and The American Prospect. She had a piece this week in Color Lines Magazine that's really provocative and interesting, so you should check that out. Um, Perez was named one of the Lambda Literary Foundation's 2010 Emerging LGBT Voices, and she is a dear friend of mine. Go ahead. Thank you, Courtney. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. And feel free to like file in and sit on the floor if you don't want to stand in the corner over there. Um, so I'm going to read a short excerpt from my essay, which is called Pillow Dancing and Other Failed Hetero Experiments. <laughs> um, after a big family dinner, my dad and stepmom were settled into the couch watching Crossfire, a favorite conservative political show of Pops. My brother and I call him Pop, short for Poppy. Fourteen and full of angst, I walked into the living room and blurted out, but what if I got pregnant? I was still burning up from our debate during dinner about teen pregnancy. You wouldn't get pregnant, first of all, but if you did, Pop stated definitively, I think you should be sent away as a punishment. This was not an atypical exchange for us. You name a political wedge issue and we probably debated it. His challenges and talking points taught me how to hone my arguments and make them as opposition ready as possible. Want to talk about abortion? I could run down the list of typical anti-choice arguments and come up with my standard responses. Want to debate about biological differences between the sexes? I had a retort for all the standard challenges. What about sports, muscle definition, intelligence? It's not easy for me to admit that conversations with my conservative father, most of which put him on the decidedly anti-feminist side of things, 
were a large part of my feminist formation. While I no longer have the patience for these kinds of debates with Pop, I do have to give him credit for always making me feel respected during our back and forth. Just the fact that he was willing to engage me with me, beginning as early as 11 or 12 years old, showed me that my ideas did matter, regardless of how wrong he thought I was. I wish I could point to a day when one of these arguments really crystallized my feminist identity. I wish I could say that one night, over arroz con pollo, I declared to my family around the table, I'm a feminist. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't, and that's because I didn't come to feminism in any one single moment. I pretty much rejected the term for a long time, afraid of the connotations that came with it, not wanting to differentiate myself from my peers. But long before I embraced the term, my experiences slowly shaped my feminist perspective. I'm skipping around a little bit, so apologize for that. Uh, my friends and I spent the majority of our social lives through high school trying to perfect the art of relating to and understanding boys. From a really young age, I had my first boyfriend in first grade. <laughs> boys were all I talked about with my circle of friends. Boys were our world. From elementary school until the day I graduated high school, dating boys was what we did, talked about, and breathed. When we were young, it was pretty innocent. Take, for example, my third grade boyfriend, William. He and I only had one face-to-face -face conversation during the entirety of our relationship <laughs> before I decided it was time to end things. I used the 1990s version of the text message breakup, avoiding any direct contact with him, by asking my friend to tell his friend to tell him it was over. <laughs> this was standard practice. My friends and I went through multiple boyfriends this way, and it kept things feeling light and inconsequential. As we reached middle school, things turned slightly more racy, and stories of friends hitting the bases with their boyfriends were common. Actual sex was still rare, but the other bases, French, feel, finger, the four Fs we called them, <laughs> you can fill in the four, uh, <laughs> were fair game. I was really into hearing about my friends' escapades, even though my streak with boys ended after it was no longer acceptable to ask someone out using the telephone game. Each day there was a new object of my affection. Entries about who danced with whom at the middle school dance, complete with a full report at the 20 girl sleepover at Catherine's house afterwards. I remember one such night clearly, because after not being asked to slow dance at all, I usually spent those songs consoling some crying friend in the girl's bathroom. I initiated a new game, Dancing with Pillows. <laughs> after making up a dance to Montel Jordan's This Is How We Do It, <laughs> remember that song, right? Ten this of us is grabbed how we do it. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I can still do the dance. <laughs> uh, ten of us grabbed pillows from the living room couch and slow danced with them, pretending they were our imaginary boyfriends. I didn't see much more action than that pillow dancing for the rest of middle and most of high school. I like to joke that I peaked early with boys. I had more boyfriends before the fifth grade than the rest of my dating career combined. <laughs> it wasn't for a lack of trying, that's for sure. I was the girl who the boys never liked, at least not in that way. Friends would all exclaim that they couldn't possibly understand why. They all liked me so much, they'd tell me after yet another rejection by one of my crushes. And then I skip over my story about how I uh, I lost my virginity and all sorts of things that you'll have to pick up the book. And then also talk about kind of going to college and coming out as queer and <clears throat> reflecting back on a lot of those relationships with, with guys and why we were all sort of doing it um, pretty badly and pretty inauthentically and having negative experiences. Um, so all those experiences growing up were fundamentally about pushing at the way gender roles were shaping my life and the lives of the people around me. I constantly argued about these limitations with my dad. Why did girls sports have different rules than boys sports? I questioned what my friends and I were doing with the boys in the back seats of our cars. Why was it so different from what we said we wanted? It wasn't until later that I found support for this questioning through my feminist community on my college campus and beyond. I no longer feel alone in these critiques. I benefit from a community of people who share a similar desire to break down the gender categories that limit and, and who question the structures that promote stereotypes. I won't argue with my dad about politics anymore, and I'm miles from those high school backseat moments, but I know they've landed me here, and for that I am grateful. Thank you, Press. Um, next, we have Doctor, and I want to say that because I'm so impressed. She said I didn't have to. Um, <laughs> Mathusa Brahmanian, who is an Indian American writer and educator. She's currently the Director of Content in the Department of Interna International Education Research and Outreach at, get ready for this, Sesame Workshop, the nonprofit that produces Sesame Street. Um, where she manages educational aspects of Sesame's initiatives in Africa, South Asia, and Haiti. How awesome is that? Um, she is active in the South 
a South Asian American community and currently serves on the board of uh, the South Asian Women's Creative Collective. Her children's fiction has appeared in Kahani Magazine and her scholar, scar, scholarly work has appeared in Penn GSE Perspectives on Urban Education, Current Issues in Con Comparative Education, and the Encyclopedia of Women and Islamic Cultures. I love that from ac academia to Sesame Street and everything in between. She currently lives in New York City with her pet rabbit who shares her love of crunchy vegetables and afternoon naps. <laughs> <laughs> and she is nobody's wife and nobody's mother. All right, Matthew. So I didn't realize I left that line. The line about the rabbit is for the children's magazine, so we have to have bios up, so I put the rabbit in, because kids, anyway, I do have a rabbit, though. Um, they, they, I'm a little embarrassed. Thank you so much for being here. It's, it's such an honor to be on this panel. So um, I'm going to skip around in my essay as well. I was actually planning on reading um, different parts that I'm going to read right now, but my little brother is here, and he's actually in the essay, so I can't not read his part. So, All right. So uh, my essay is called um, The Brown Girl's Guide to Labels, 1998. When they heard that I had been accepted at Brown University, friends from my suburban high school filled my yearbook with dire warnings and heartfelt advice about the cosmetic consequences of my potential liberalization. Don't forget to shave your armpits was a popular one. Don't let me see you burning your bra on CNN next year was another. When I got to Brown, I was told that getting a degree was important, but that the real reason we were in college was to find ourselves. I soon discovered that the most common way to find oneself was to adopt a label. Among my white girlfriends, the most popular of these labels was feminist. I'm not saying that men and women shouldn't be different, they told me. I'm just saying they should be equal. This sounded about right to me, so I decided to investigate. In between my highly practical science classes, I listened in on spirited conversations about the need to move away from the image of bra-burning pierced harridans with hairy armpits, this sounded familiar, and toward embracing and celebrating our desire to wear lipstick and short skirts without judgment. Other than a modicum of knowledge I had gained in seventh grade, which is the year I spent wearing foundation and designer skirts in a desperate attempt to cover up my acne and naivete, I didn't know much about fashion. Then there was the whole battle to reclaim the word sexy, a battle I couldn't join simply because I couldn't bring myself to invest in reclaiming a word I had never claimed in the first place and probably never would. White girls were sexy. The spectacled Indian girls who took AP physics and ran for president of a debate team were not. <laughs> of course, the whole Indian thing presented another option. Released from the whitewashed suburbs, I discovered a contingent of South Asian Americans who embraced their ethnic identities by labeling themselves as either Desi or Brown. I occasionally ate lunch with them before lab or spent late nights with them working on problem sets. The girls ironed their hair, wore huge earrings, and lusted after South Asian boys who shortened their names to Jay or Ace and wore too much cologne. Oh my god, did you hear that Deepthi likes Jay when a typical conversation? Seriously, you know she's just trying to snag a husband, it continued. Um, gross. Wait, I totally saw the perfect wedding sari online yesterday. Want to see it? It usually ended. Well, clearly this wasn't going to work. It wasn't, it wasn't until years later that I discovered that these girls were the minority and that there was a whole subset of Desi women who fantasized about political activism and artistic fame rather than elaborate weddings. At the time, though, I thought that brown was not the label for me. By the end of my freshman year, I had picked out several potential majors and no potential labels. So then the next year is 1999, and I end up going to India. And uh, there's a, at the beginning of this section, there's a conversation with my mom and my grandmother in which my grandmother says, um, you're getting old, you better get married. And my mother says, you know, she can do whatever she wants, she can find a choice. Um, and then I walk into the main room out from the balcony, and my brother is looking at the want ads for me trying to find me a husband. <laughs> So <laughs> this is that section of the essay. <laughs> so I walked inside and found my brother huddled beneath the ceiling fan reading the paper. What are you doing, I asked him. Finding you a husband, he said, without looking up. Seriously, I said. Yeah, he said, pushing his glasses up on his nose. But you're doomed. He said doomed the way my family always said the word to each other with a thick Indian accent rolling our tongues around the Ds. Basically, they want someone to cook them curry. What, I said, I make a damn good curry. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about how good the curry is, he said. It's about focusing your skill set, as in only being able to make curry. In this market, autonomy and independent thought seem to be discouraged. 
But hey, if you drop out of college, you might still make the cut. I mean, if you finish, you'll be overqualified, so. <laughs> my grandmother slid up beside me and placed her gnarled hand on my shoulder. Her wrinkled brown skin always reminded me of walnuts. Mothingi, she said, men are useless. Your mother is right, don't get married. <laughs> oh, I said, okay, thanks. <laughs> Good, she said. She nodded, adjusted her sari, and walked resolutely into the kitchen. My brother tapped the paper excitedly. Hey, this guy wants someone with a master's degree. I bet he settled with someone for someone with a bachelor's. He said, this is it. This is your man. Be still my beating heart, I said. So then the rest of the essay is kind of about um, my journey to find a word for feminism that reconciled being Indian and being American at the same time. So, but if you want to find out, you'll have to read the essay. <laughs> Bro got called out. <laughs> All right. Um, so next up, we have Hoshunda Sanders, who is a religion reporter at the Austin American Statesman, a journalism instructor at the University of Texas, and my personal favorite, a part-time reference librarian at the Austin Community College. I have a big thing for librarians. Um, she's contributed half a dozen essays for SEAL Press anthologies, including Click, Secrets and Confidences, P.S. What I Didn't Say, and Homelands. Her work has appeared in Bitch Magazine, Vibe, and several national newspaper, and she lives in Austin, Texas with her adorable Mastiff Shepherd, Cleo. Aww. Thanks for being here, everybody. I said I wouldn't yell and use my outside Bronx voice, so I might be too soft. I'll try to keep it up. Uh, the name of my essay is, uh, What's the Female Version of a Hustler? Woman is Training for a Bronx Nerd. Um, and it basically uh, talks about um, I never really identified as a feminist because I thought it was associated with white women. Um, and for me, making the choice between becoming a rapper and being a writer ended up being about making this choice between being a womanist and being a feminist, um, which I try to explain in the, in the essay. I have loved stories since I was a little girl. I ordered florid romances by mail and stole Sweet Valley High books from the Doubleday bookstore on Fifth Avenue. <laughs> Before I knew better, the stories I enjoyed were mostly escapist literature for me, tales of white women that involved lounging in bikinis or falling in love or doing what they wanted. This was novel to me. I did what was in front of me, what was, access what was accessible. Black girls did not lounge by Cretona Pool, for example, where the water was shallow and there were likely to be dirty needles around. In the inner city, relaxation was not an option. Still, in seventh grade, when I was a skinny, introverted girl who checked out piles of books from the New York Public Library, I read everything from academics Bell Hooks and Cornell West to Jackie Collins' Lucky Series, still one of my favorites. I believed some version of a plentiful intellectual life was possible, but it looked white. My private junior high school was full of black nerds just like me, so I felt encouraged. Then we all graduated and my closest friends went off to boarding school where financial aid and academic scholarships had catapulted them. Without either of those things, I was left behind without a supportive intellectual community and as a freshman at Aquinas, an all girls Catholic school in the hood. Instead of studying though, I decided to shut down emotionally and to become the meanest chick ever. Specifically, I wanted to be a gangsta bitch. <laughs> like the Apache rap song of the same name. And you can see how improbable this is, right? Okay. <laughs> I started dating John, who was a few years older than me, and worked in the locker room at the Boys and Girls Club, where I went after school with my homegirl, Linnell. After work, he and his friends would rap outside of his apartment building a couple times a week. And this inspired me to start writing my own raps. And there are none of them in this essay. <laughs> There's always Q&A. <laughs> Don't you thread me with that. Okay. <laughs> One day, John asked me to spit a rhyme for him, and after he heard it, he was so excited that he deemed me lady raw and intelligent. He was raw and intelligent, so that was the lady version. <laughs> <laughs> My heart wanted something different, something that seemed impossible. I wanted to be a writer, but I thought that dream was impractical and definitely out of my reach. The writers I emulated were black women like Audre Lorde, Nikki Giovanni, Zora Neale Hurston, and Alice Walker, but none of them had come from where I had come from. They were also years older than me, and in my generation, black girls who were smart got teased and beat up for it. 
Um, I was tossed into a dumpster <laughs> in the schoolyard of CS67, for instance, after getting 100 on too many spelling tests. How, I thought, would I get from the trash bins of the Bronx to bookstores like Doubleday? <laughs> Besides, it seemed uppity to John and his friends, and later to me, to think that to be a real writer, I needed to write essays or books. In my generation, I would need to become a rapper. It required courage as a brute force decision, one that looked brave like the rest of the women and men in my hood. I was striving for some kind of mediocrity, some way to fit in with what I was supposed to become instead of alienating myself from my friends, my homeboys, and yes, my man. And there's a description of womanism, if you guys are not familiar with it, that I won't read here, but it's basically um, about being a, a black woman who also believes in the equality of women, but also um, feels uh, uh, like womanish. So it's from a black folk expression, um, and it's about outrageous, audacious behavior and um, being grown up and acting grown up, which I wasn't at that time. Um, feminism to me was a Manhattan brand of freedom. Being valued as a feminist required cash, a fly crib in a borough where people mattered, and a sense of entitlement. I had nothing but pride, and no time to be pissed off at John or any man who appreciated me as I was when the rest of the world, a world in fact that included feminists, ignored me. But I've also always loved words and wrangling with sentences more than bravado, essays and thoughtful styling more than lyrical barbs. In the rap game, with all of its posturing, I was being more of a girl, not a woman. I was immature, regressing by embodying the stereotypes others had threatened to render me invisible. Walker's definition of womanism revised the space for me in a larger worldly context. I had believed as a rapper that to be like feminists, I had to be a woman who was equal to or even more aggressive than any man. It sounds stupid now, even as I admit it to myself, but that's the problem with youth. <laughs> you have lots of energy and time to come up with half-baked theories about things, but not a lick of sense to really make it all come together. <laughs> Thankfully, the second time I applied to boarding school, I got in. And when I left the Bronx, when I was around more white women who more frequently used the word feminism, I carved out in my mind a space for myself as a newly branded womanist. I stopped rapping and started to sing, this time as a hobby, and this time it was songs written by bands like Extreme and the Indigo Girls. <laughs> Claiming my voice gave me room to write, too, which I've been doing passionately ever since. Most women don't use the word womanist. As a journalist, writer, and bookworm who reads avidly, I have yet to see the word enter mainstream discourse on a consistent basis. Not that it matters. As Sandy Banks, a writer for the Los Angeles Times wrote in April, the newest generation of would-be feminists or womanists is the beneficiary of the work of women before us. But it's more than a question of terminology, she wrote. It's the evolution of a movement that succeeds by making itself obsolete. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am so honored by like how talented everyone is in this anthology. I wish you all could hear them longer, but we are going to do Q&A, so you'll hear their voices more. Um, so my partner in crime next to me is Jay Courtney Sullivan. She's the author of the New York Times best-selling novel, Commencement, which if you haven't checked it out, is amazing and is, is largely based on Smith College and these young women's friendships. And it's just for this crowd, I'm sure it's like the perfect novel, so check it out. Um, her writing has appeared in the New York Times, Book Review, the Chicago Tribune, New York Magazine, Elle, Glamour, Men's Vogue, and the New York Observer, among others. Um, she's the contributor to the essay anthology, The Secret Currency of Love, um, and obviously the co-editor of this anthology. Her second novel, Maine, uh, will be published by Knopf in June 2011, so definitely look out for that. Um, and she lives in Brooklyn, New York, thankfully. Yay. Here she is. <laughs> um, does everyone in the room know that Courtney did a TED Women talk this last week in front of 700 people? So I'm just basking in the glow of her right now. <laughs> just wanted everyone to know about that. Um, one of the themes that really kept coming up in Click, uh, in the Click essays, was the fact that sort of mothers loom very large for women as they're kind of claiming their identities. And when that came to feminism, uh, half the time it seemed like in the case of Jessica Valenti's essay that you know her mother was this proud second wave feminist and as a result she was like I want nothing to do with feminism get, get me away from that but eventually she came around which is good for all the readers of feministing um, I was the opposite and so that's what my essay is about 
One of the sounds I associate most with my childhood is the click clicking of high heels on the front walk sometime after dusk each night. Through the window, I'd hear my mother coming home from work and feel a little jolt of excitement. When the door opened, she'd often be laden down with grocery bags and the smell of her perfume, it was called creation, filled the hallway. She worked in television and later had her own public relations firm. She won two Emmy Awards before she turned 30. Some years she out-earned my father, a lawyer who worked from home when both I and my sister were small. In some ways, he has always been the more stereotypically feminine of the pair. He is sweet and sensitive and gentle. When they got engaged, my mother told him she didn't do laundry. <laughs> to this day, all dirty clothes at 32 Garden Street are the province of my dad. As a little girl, I went to the office with my mother from time to time. She set me up at a desk where I worked on various imaginary projects and treated her indulgent assistant as my own. But for the most part, my mother's professional self was a mystery to me. The clothes she wore to work, dark skirt suits and silk scarves and three-inch pointy-toed heels, were like a uniform for that other part of her life, the part that existed off stage. They suggested something bigger and better and more exciting than our suburban existence had to offer. After bedtime, while my parents watched the news downstairs, I would occasionally snoop about in their room, sneaking one of my mother's scarves out of her closet and wrapping it around my head, Marilyn Monroe style. I'd breathe in the scent of creation and imagine who I might become. I liked boys a lot, but unlike many of my friends, I never planned a wedding. When we played house, I was always the mom, the working mom who walked in the door at seven and kicked off her stilettos before starting dinner. <laughs> I thought a lot about my career. I wanted to be a writer, an actress, a hairstylist, a lawyer, and a fashion designer. I saw no reason why I couldn't be all five at once. Instead of stickers, I collected while you were out notepads on which my imaginary secretary, Denise, this is true, left me dozens of urgent messages. <laughs> Without discussing it in any sort of academic way, without discussing it at all, really, my parents taught me through their actions about the possibilities of gender balance in a marriage. They taught me that a woman can be powerful and opinionated and strong-willed, and at the same time be maternal. That a man can be simultaneously masculine and nurturing, and he might just know things about fabric softener that his wife could never guess. <laughs> Mostly because of what I saw in other people's homes, I knew that our life was atypical for both our town and our traditional extended Irish Catholic family. Sometimes playing at a friend's house, I'd hear her mother threaten, just wait until your father gets home. In my house, there was no such threat. My mother could be silly and fun and tender, but if she got mad, look out. Another common remark from kids around the neighborhood, we get to have pizza tonight, our dad is babysitting. I thought this was strange even then. How can your parent be babysitting you? In my family, dad was just as likely as mom to stay home with you if you were sick or bring your lunch to school if you forgot it on the kitchen counter. This is not to say that we lived a life of egalitarian bliss or that I ever gazed out over my Tyson chicken nuggets and complimented my mother <laughs> on being a perfect model of modern woman. I was fiercely proud of her, and in my precocious way, I might remark to a schoolmate, Oh, your mom's a teacher? That's nice. Mine's VP of communication. <laughs> Even so, I was often jealous of the fact that other kids in my neighborhood didn't come home to babysitters after school or have to go to day camp in the summertime. Their stay-at-home moms effortlessly made French braids and brownies or decorated sweatshirts with iron-on Easter bunny appliques and puffy paint. My mother didn't have time for that. Our Christmas lights were usually still up in March. If I begged her for a puffy paint sweatshirt, she'd make me one. But her letters were off, the iron-on slightly lumpy. I'd let her know that her handiwork was not up to snuff by cruelly choosing to wear the perfect shirt my friend Caitlin's mother had made me instead. Aww. So mean. <laughs> uh, in middle school, the word, the word feminism was just beginning to make its way into my consciousness. Like a lot of women from her generation and mine, even though my mother embodied what it meant to be a feminist, she never called herself one. If anything, she grew embarrassed and self-conscious when I tried to engage her in a conversation about what it meant to be an independent, professionally successful woman like her. 
as if I were really just criticizing her for being lousy on the home front. She came from a no-frills working class family. She was the first one of them to go to college. She seemed to think there was something negative or self-indulgent about calling oneself a feminist. She once told me, only half joking, that the women's movement might be a ploy to get females to do more work, both at the office and around the house. And that's when I began to realize that my mother was overwhelmed. She seemed to suspect that feminism, if it applied to her at all, was part of what had gotten her into the jam in the first place. As it is with many girls, my relationship with my mother quickly went from idolizing her as a kid to misunderstanding and disliking her as an adolescent. I had a high school English teacher named Maxine, a writer who understood the importance and also the limitations of words. She seemed different from my mother in most every way, and I adored her at once. Maxine had long, tanned limbs and dark hair with flecks of gray mixed in. She always wore pants and sensible flats. She had no children. My freshman year, she married an artist in a wedding ceremony officiated by Howard Zinn. How cool is that? It's really cool. <laughs> Most important of all, she was a loud and proud, card-carrying feminist. Maxine was the rare sort of teacher who I just wanted to be around all the time who, more to the point, I just wanted to be. I spent many after-school hours sitting at her desk talking about literature and life and love. Feminism always made its way into the conversation, and she spoke the language with passion. By junior year, my bedroom door was plastered with bumper stickers that said, in goddess we trust, and <laughs> feminism is the radical notion that women are people. Which I think Katha Pollitt was the first person who said that. And oh, Katha really? Pollitt's daughter, Sophie Pollitt Cohen, has an essay in our anthology, which is very interesting. You yeah. should read it. Um, my bookshelves were crammed full of Susan Faludi and Catherine McKinnon and, and Andrea Dworkin. I attended rallies and lectures and attempted to engage my uncles in debates about abortion while they were trying to watch Notre Dame football on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> I decided to attend a women's college known for its fierce feminist underpinnings. My parents mostly seemed amused by all of this viewing it as a byproduct of teenagehood, something rough and overly intense that would be tamed in time, like the blue streaks in my hair or the oxblood flu vog boots I wore even in August. You're a feminist, I would tell my mother over and over again. No, I'm not, she'd say. Well, why? What do you think it means anyway? Oh, please, not this again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it goes on, and eventually my mom did start calling herself Feminist. You'll have to read to find out why. <laughs> All right, well, we'll start with a follow up to Courtney because you just invited it. So, does that mean your dad has also admitted that he's a feminist? Where does he stand? Hmm. Well, I have to say, I'm not sure. I still don't quite know. Do we call men feminists or do we call them like feminist sympathizers? When I was in college, I thought the latter, but now I think the former. So I don't think I ever bothered to ask my dad. And it also seemed clear that he was already on the page, whereas my mother, right. probably having been asked, I mean, later in the essay, I sort of talk about ways in which my mother probably, like, she never changed her name, but people always called her Mrs. Sullivan mm -hmm. to the point where even when she had her own company, it had. Gallagher, which is her maiden name, was called Gallagher Sullivan Communications. You know, it's like, so wow. she in some ways really embodied it, and I think my father does as well. Um, but in some ways, the culture isn't always ready for it or wasn't, right. especially where we lived. And it sounds like she was actually more defensive about the label in some ways because yeah, it was something put on her. Yeah, my father would probably say, sure, yeah, I'm a feminist, great. Right. You know, whereas my mother was kind of pushing back against it. It's really interesting. Um, so, Miriam, I wanted to ask you some of what you talked about arguing about with your dad, because I know you now, it, it's so touching to me because it's essentially essentialism, right? This idea that men and women are inherently different in various ways. And I know now that that's a lot of, of where you're drawn to write and sort of argue both both of folks who are not feminists, but also really within the feminist movement. Right. We've got a, a large kind of swath of people who talk about feminism in very essentialist terms. These are people who would say, if women ruled the world, there would be no war, right? Like that's the, the most obvious and common example. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the fact that that was in your heart at such a young age and it's still part of your work. Like, do you see that as a continuum for you or? 
Yeah, I mean, it, it started with just a lot of questions, right? Like asking questions about the stuff I saw around me. You know, I grew up with a brother, so, and in, you know, I mean, so that's probably all Is he here? Scene. Can we embarrass him He's too? Not, but my mom <laughs> okay. is here, though, and Aww. I do want to say that. My mom. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, Mar but Miriam's mom? mom is here, actually. Yeah, yeah. So thanks to my mom for coming. <laughs> yes, and she, she is in the essay, and I do talk about her as sort of a feminist role model for me because she did, my parents divorced at a very young age, and she sort of raised me and my brother as an independent woman, and that was a very big feminist model for me. So in contrast to my conservative sort of anti-feminist father. But, um, but yeah, the, I, you know, I feel like these questions about gender difference are at the root of feminism, um, and they're at the root, they're sort of at the root of my coming to feminism is sort of just asking very basic questions of why do we treat boys differently than girls, and why are, you know, boys' sports rules different than girls' sports, and what do we think about, you know, the differences between boys and girls in that way, and I think um, what for me has evolved is feminism has evolved. Those questions, the questions are still there, but I think the answers are different and the realities are different because feminism has come so far. Mm -hmm. um, because in many ways our lives, my life is very different than my mom's life because of the work of the feminists um, who've come before us. So I think the questions we ask are different. So now the question of like, is a man a feminist? Um, to me, shouldn't be a question anymore, right? Because I think that feminism shouldn't be about women versus men and women's equality and women can do everything that men can do. It should be about kind of creating a world where people aren't limited by their gender identity, period, whatever it may be. Um, so it's, it, but that's because feminists have come so far. So I think there's a lot of that, that's what I'm invested in is that conversation about how is feminism moving um, around this issue of gender identity because of what's come before us. Right. It also seems like a real kernel about the performance of gender because in your essay there's this whole thing of you kind of performing heteronormativity and, and all the girls are performing it because no one even wants to date boys yet but we're all pretending we do. And so it's like, it's interesting that part of the continuum is also recognizing that gender is a performance so that you can then perform it in the way you want to. Like you kind of reclaim the performance in a certain way. Would you right. talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I talk about kind of, you know, the I sort of followed in line as a kid because the, the only models I had were sort of very straight, um, you know, very gendered models of girls wear this and boys wear that and, you know, you buy whatever's on the rack of Abercrombie and & Fitch and, and, and only on the girls' side, never on the boys' side kind of thing. And then going to college, sort of starting to meet role models and friends of mine who are less gender conforming and kind of like tomboys or like, you know, um, you know, just sort of dressed more boyishly. And I, it, I talk sometimes about this experience of going with a friend of mine to an American Eagle and she immediately went over to um, like the left side of the store where all the guys clothes was. And I was like, what are you doing? And I like, We're allowed I'm like, to what do are that? you doing over here? And she's like, what are you talking about? I like, I, you know, I buy guys clothes. I was like, and I had this moment of like, oh my God, you can do that. Like, I, as if there was this, like, you know, this, like, fence that you couldn't cross, and if you tried to buy something, they would, like, frown at you, which, you know, that could happen, but, so it was this moment of, like, oh, my God, there's this whole other world, like, I have a whole other way of being, a whole other way of, like, presenting myself gender-wise, so, yeah, there's a sort of idea of gender as performance um, that's a piece of that, right, that, that, but I sort of was, like, okay, here's all these other role models that I have now yeah. for what you can be, what it means to be a woman or what it means to, to kind of present yourself in the world, and that was a big piece of my own coming out and my own, and I think like I bring that to, to feminism, definitely. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. Um, Matthew, I was thinking a lot, there's a piece in Matthew's essay which she didn't read, which is about discovering the work of Chandra Mohanty, um, who for those who don't know is just this like incredibly gifted academic feminist. Um, and I recently heard her at the National Women's Studies Association meeting, I was sitting with Samita Mukhopadhyay, who's a co-editor with us at Feministing, and by the end, I was so alienated because she's just like so smart and it was so academic that I couldn't even, and I have a you know, master's degree, whatever, but I could not kind of wrap my head around it. So I was thinking about the contrast between being able to find, okay, there's these, all these incredible South Asian feminists writing this stuff, but, um, and particularly since you work at Sesame Street and then also do academic stuff, I wondered if you could talk about kind of that academic continuum and um, the, the tension between the potential alienation of very academic writing and then the power of obviously seeing someone like Chandra Mohanty writing the kind of stuff she writes. Like, how do you deal with that struggle? So, um, so the essay that I've actually referenced in, in my essay is uh, Feminism Without Borders, which is one of her more, um, I think, accessible right. works. But I mean, I think for, for me, the thing is, um, it's like my, I come from a long line of women who I think are considered feminists. I mean, my grandmother, who's in this essay, she was, you know, she was one of the first 
female doctors in India. And she, my mom, you know, my mom is a, my family is very politically active and very kind of politicized. But because we're Indian, I just never thought we could be feminists, right? So to me, the power of someone like in Umunarayan or Chandra Mohanty is actually, I mean, it's not, I mean, it, it's not even just reading their essays, it's the fact that here's a woman who looks like me, who thinks like me, who's from my part of the world, who looks like my mom, who looks like my grandma, and she's a feminist, right. you know? So I think, I, I think that there's, there's it's a, I mean, and I guess the other thing that comes to mind is this, um, is this great TED talk by um, Chimananda Adichie, who mm -hmm. writes um, Half a Yellow Sun, she's like a Nigerian author, and she talks in the talk, that. it's about the danger of a single story. And for me, feminism was always a single story. It was right. always Gloria Steinem, right. you know? It was always Naomi Klein. So just seeing these other women and seeing these other stories and feeling like my story fit with theirs and not with the way that these same women were writing about, you know, India. Because these, you know, someone to, like, even if it's easy to read uh, Naomi Klein or Gloria Steinem, neither of whom writes about India, the way that they write about it didn't feel accessible. You right. know, this, like... Right all these women are oppressed, they have a hundred babies, they have, you know, whatever, like, I don't know, I mean, I'm related to a, really, a lot of really loud, domineering women, like, I, right. you know, <laughs> like, I don't know anyone like the woman in Brick Lane, like, you know, right. like, my, my aunties are in charge, and there's no question about right. it, you know, right. so I think for me, it's just seeing that in the world, and seeing it, um, seeing someone like that in the academy, getting called an academic and a leading scholar, for me, is the most important piece right. of it. Right, right, and, and it's interesting you say that because part of your job now is to create stories on this international level for children, right? So how does your you know, feminist sensibility come into that work? Are you really conscious on a regular basis of trying to present all these different stories for kids? Yeah, and I think it goes into my work as a writer and my work on, on Saucy, on the, on the board of this organization as well. I think it's just about, um, you know, kids learn gender from, and this is my doctoral hat on, kids learn their gender <laughs> roles at the age of two and three is what psychologists usually say. I mean, that's very early to know that girls are supposed to play with dolls and boys are supposed to play with trucks. And it happens in families where parents are very consciously not trying to do those things. Right. So a lot of my job is kind of distilling those things down and making them, you know, easy for kids. And also, you know, the children's fiction I write is like that as well. I mean, it's not, it's not easy, but I think a lot of it is the mindset you come at. I mean, just the idea that the protagonist in a story can be a seven-year-old Indian girl. Right. You know, and that, you know, it doesn't have to be a story about India. Right. It could be a detective novel. She just happens to be Indian. Right. You know, so I think it's more, it's, it's understanding the concepts, but it's also shifting your mindset, I think a lot of it is. Right. So. And that seems like a really awesome moment we're at. I feel like there's, there, diversity used to mean you have the person on the panel representing their particular, you know, location of diversity, right? And I feel like there's a new consciousness about have people of diverse background who are not there to represent the entire population right. of those they are identified with, right? Yeah. So yeah. It, it does seem to be like we're starting to get there to some degree. Um, Hoshinda, I wanted to ask you the, the quote at the end that you read is so provocative, right? The idea that if the movement becomes obsolete, like that that's the point, is that the movement should become obsolete. Do you feel like the movement is moving towards being obsolete? Do you feel, because it's, it's, <laughs> it's so kind of fragmented, right? I mean, yeah. there's, I mean, even the people on this panel, like we all do such different kinds of work, even though we all had this anthology in common. Um, it's certainly not the movement that, either womanist or feminist, that we've seen before in terms of the cohesion. What do you think about that? All right, that's a really hard question also. Let me just point that out. <laughs> but You're I mean, up to it. <laughs> man, okay, I almost would have rather you'd ask me to rap. I mean, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Oh, it's, I'm just an, kidding. it's a total option no, no, no. if you'd no, no, prefer no, no, to no. rap. No, 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 I was just joking. Okay. I was joking. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, or I think, sing. I mean, I, oh. You said sing. Oh, well, man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, so, I mean, I think, um, I wish, I wish that we're on its way to becoming obsolete, but I think that it's kind of like anything else. Like, my favorite thing about December is that it's a time of reflection, right, as you get ready for the new year. And so I think of that as my time to revise my dreams, right? Mm -hmm. Because I, I've achieved some of them, and some of them are still, not, still out there in the universe. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how it is for feminism. I think that there are some things that have been achieved, but clearly women still don't make as much as men. You know, there are women who become CEOs and then, you know, opt out, and there's like this odd discussion about that. So they become mothers, so then they're not 
the same, they're not as valuable to some people, and so, so I think there are all these other kinds of discussions that have started to happen that mean that the, the movement still has life in it as a movement, but it is gonna maybe look like something else. Mm -hmm. um, and so the question is how to, how to keep that conversation going in any kind of con cohesive way, because as women achieve some of their, their dreams, and you know maybe male feminists, if we want to you know add them, mm -hmm. um, it, as they see those things shift, um, the question is, what are your new dreams going to be? You mm -hmm. know, what what is your new vision of feminism going to mm -hmm. become? Mm -hmm. And you know, I don't really know that anyone knows. Yeah, which is such an important question because I feel like uh, uh, many of us do the kind of work where we're constantly in response. Mm -hmm. You know, at, at feministing when we're blogging, we're like. What's the news of the day? What do we need to say in response to all the shitty stuff going on, right. as opposed to like, mm -hmm. what do we want to envision? Like, what can we put out there that's a new, mm -hmm. um, you know, we could try to do that in our leadership, obviously, um, or other ways, but that's a really important, vital point. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Court, I'm going to throw one more at you and then we'll let the audience. Uh, so, Courtney occupies an interesting space and she's a novelist, um, and I think a lot about this because her novel, when I read it, my first reaction was like, oh my gosh fictional heroines can be just like me. Like, it was, the, it was one of the first times I read about young women that I really identified in a contemporary novel, because um, it seems like sort of the world of the novel is a fairly male world still, or like a world that just didn't feel anywhere close to my experience. Like, my experience wasn't romantic enough to be in a novel, you know, and that was kind of um, what my first reaction out of Courtney's novel. And I was, and of course people tried to um, target it as chiclet, like in this respectful way, it was like, oh, it's a smart woman's chiclet, right? <laughs> Which is like a really bizarre thing to say, because you're like, what are you saying about people who like chiclet? And what is chiclet? I don't know, it's a very complicated question. But I, I wanted you to just speak to what it's like to be a feminist and a novelist and, and write about young women. Um, do you feel that pressure to be fit into a particular kind of box around those labels? Um, interesting. Well, uh, Commencement, in many ways, that's the name of the novel, does deal with feminism. It, one of the four main characters ends up working um, particularly on the issue of sex trafficking, which is something that is very important to me. I had worked for four years for Bob Herbert, one of the op-ed columnists at the New York Times, and did quite a lot of research on that. And I think being a newspaper researcher and writer, especially with the kind of shrinking um, word counts that you're allowed to have these days, sometimes the most interesting parts of a story end up on the cutting room floor. And fiction is such a wonderful place to use those. Mm. So in some ways, I loved that. And I wanted to explore feminism in that very direct way. Um, and also kind of what happens to like a campus activist when they go out into the real world. What is it like? Mm -hmm. um, and then how does feminism fit into these characters' lives in smaller ways. In the beginning of the book, one of them is getting married, and no one can believe she's gonna change her last name, and she's registered for a KitchenAid mixer and all of these things. Or like, you went to Smith, how the hell did this happen? But you know, there, but at the same time, this is a character who works for now, and who's very interested in embracing feminism in her own way. And so, they're all kind of trying to make sense of it, I guess, in that mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what did I wanna say? Oh, the chiclet thing. Um, you know, in some ways I feel like it's a little bit like that Jessica Seinfeld cookbook where she puts the spinach in brownies or something because yeah. <laughs> a lot of women have told me, oh, I thought your book would be this fun beach read, but I really did learn a lot about women's the women's movement and women's issues from it. So I think in a way that's kind of good. Yeah. But um, the descriptions and definitions of fiction are so odd. Like I saw, I mean, my book has been described as literary fiction. It's been described as chiclet. And I was in a bookstore in, I think, um, Ann Arbor, and they had a little write-up, like, staff recommends, and they said, this thriller will keep you up all night. I'm like, thriller? <laughs> but, um, okay, I'll take it. But um, actually, something that you said to me really put me at ease, was, which was that my book had the first feminist villain you'd ever seen, and you liked that. Ah. And that made me happy, because with fiction, you know, unlike writing a newspaper piece or a magazine piece, you really don't know where the characters are going to go. And there is a character in Commencement who, um, she is not based on any one sort of second wave feminist, but she's very radical. 
personally, I would identify as a McKinnonite. I think Catherine McKinnon is an absolute genius, and not everyone necessarily does, but I do. And you know, I think that in some ways, this character is cons is, is radical in the sense that some people in the movement are, have kind of pushed her away. And in, in that, she's not based on Catherine McKinnon. Nobody write that on a blog or anything. I don't want to get an email from Catherine McKinnon, <laughs> but. But just that idea of a radical feminist and people even within her own movement not being quite sure, at the same time, she's a person who creates massive amounts of change. Right. But this character wasn't a villain initially, but in the end, she did become one. And with fiction, you can't always control, you know, it's not, it's not like a message thing. Like, this character has to turn out to be good. Right. So that was something I sort of worried about, but then you put me at ease by telling me that. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right, so let's hear from the audience. I'm sure this is such a, a big group. We really appreciate everyone coming out. Anyone have questions about the essays you heard, specifically about you know women's perspectives on young feminism in, in particular? Yes. Smith College, yeah. I'll repeat, the question was where Courtney had gone to school. Courtney's a Smith grad. I'm a Barnard grad. All women's colleges are definitely in the house. I think there's something when you, for me at least, I had grown up in this fairly traditional Irish Catholic family and I was constantly just waging war on my uncles in particular who are very conservative about everything, all issues, but mostly women's issues. And they're lawyers and they're really good fighters. So many times in high school, I would be fighting them and I would end up in tears and I would end up tongue tied. And the first time that one of them said to me, good point, just good point. <laughs> oh my God, I was so full of pride. I could not <laughs> believe it. And so I was so used to kind of fighting, fighting, fighting. And when I got to Smith, in a way, it was almost disturbing because it suddenly felt everyone agreed. And it would be, yeah. like I'd be like, wait a minute. So then I would sort of start playing devil's advocate just because I felt, well, now I have to. And in a way, I think it kind of helped me be more fully formed that I came from that. I mean, Mary, your piece is similar in a way, this sort of idea of like pushing back, pushing back against a you know, family member. Um, but then, you know, sometimes you'll just remember what they said and bits of it seep in. Yeah. <laughs> It's yeah. funny, I, I didn't go to a women's college because I was when I was looking at college, I was like, well, I can't go to women's college. I want to date men. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. Whoops. <laughs> Whoops. Any other questions? thought I saw a hand back there. Is everyone shy? Okay. Yes. I don't really have a question, but I just want to say it's really great to hear what you guys have to say. I have a daughter who identifies as a third wave feminist. She's probably a handful of so years younger than you guys. And Thank you. Thank you. That's really sweet. Yes. Uh, I just want to know that you, you brought up Chandra Mahanti and you know, working here for like three, four years, and it's like the second time her name has come up. And for me personally, reading her work, I had the total opposite experience that you had. Mm. It was the first time I could really go, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That deals with my little mo my mother in an African village and what she's doing, uh, and having never heard of feminism, but taking care of orphans and doing tons of mm -hmm. other stuff. So I'm curious as to how concepts like feminism without borders were seen right at the center of what needs to happen for the movement to come to the next level. Because the one thing I continually watch is sort of the racial stratification mm -hmm. of, of, of stuff all the time. How do, how, how do you guys work to bring that more into to the center of the conversation? kind of scares me to hear that that had, like, flew, a lot of that had flown over your head, because for me, that was actually the entry point where I went, wow, I get what she's saying. Yeah, well, I, I should be very clear. I was at the National Women's Studies Association meeting, so it's a place, the context is such, I think that's where someone like Chandra Mahanti feels like she can give out her like most sophisticated, like potentially esoteric ideas, because it's like these are academic feminists. I don't happen to have a lot of academic feminist training, so... Perhaps it was more, I mean, her, I've read her stuff and not been alienated, but hearing her speak, I was like, whoa. And the other meta thing was she was speaking about sort of beyond borders, like speaking about how do we create this accessibility, but her language is so inaccessible that I was just like, my mind was sort of being blown. But, um, 
But I think, if, does anyone want to speak to that idea? I mean, inter, one of the things I hear talking about is kind of this intersectionality idea, right? So um, feminism is not about, you know, as we have repeatedly said here, women's equality necessarily, but about race, class, gender, ability, sexual orientation, all of these things coming together and forming our experiences as men and women. Um, and how do we sort of create a, a liberation around people getting to truly be who they are in the world without these prescriptive roles or these systemic inequalities that hold them back? Um, that's the lens through which I try to write my work. It's the lens through which we at Feministing try to do our work. Um, does anyone else want to speak about how you see those intersections coming together? Um, so I, th I think it's a hard question, but I think, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. And actually, Chandra Mahanti led me to Patricia Hill Collins and a lot of kind of black feminists. This was kind of my entry point into this whole women of color type feminism that really resonated with me in a way that white feminism did not. Um, and actually, the woman who gave it to me is, she's one of the most amazing professors I've ever had, and she was white. And she was like, I, I think you'll like this. You know, I know you're feeling alienated. This is what. Um, but I think that at least when I was in grad school and now being out in the world, there's, um, there's just, there's not a lot of panels like this where there's conversation between the, the two worlds, particularly at academic panels. I mean, when I present at academic conferences and I present my work on South Asia, the room is full of South Asians. You know, and when, when I happen to go to a panel that's about African Americans, the room is full of African Americans. And I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, those spaces are really important, and they're very important to me in particular because, you know, I grew up in the Midwest where I was the only brown person for miles around other than my brother, right? So, like, you know, you have a great tan was a very common thing that I heard growing up in Wisconsin. So, so those, <laughs> those spaces where you have people, I mean, th th I think there needs to be space for both, those safe spaces where you can all, you know, like when you read Commencement, Right. That was a space for you where you felt like, oh, this, this is me. This is somebody I can see. Right. But I don't think that there's a lot of conversation happening between, um, between the people that it needs to happen you know, for that. That was completely incoherent. But I think there needs to be more conversation between people who come from different places in order for solidarity to happen. And I think at least my experience, um, these movements are just kind of coming together, at least in my Like a lot of us are just kind of finding our feet within the spaces, and so there hasn't been a lot of movement between spaces because, I mean, Chandra Mohante's essay came out in what, like, like 98 maybe, 2001? So that's not very long by academic standards. Mm -hmm. You know, I do think it's a direction things need to be going in, but uh, uh, there's, in, you know, even writing my dissertation, I think I found four authors, maybe, who I could use, who were from that movement. So I think it's a combination of building it up and also starting to realize where we're coming from when we're talking to each other. Mm -hmm. One last point is just the idea that the moment of connection that you had with her novel, I think that within the world of writers of color, that's happening more now than like ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and young adult fiction too, which I think is really key. Yeah, you know, it's not just Sweet Valley High anymore, right? It's like, yeah. Yeah. you know, I love Sweet Valley High. Is it possible? <laughs> is it because I'm a person of color that I feel that experience with that stuff? And is it necessarily that you wouldn't feel that same experience with that stuff mm -hmm. if it was on the palette? Yeah, I mean, a different experience. My brother is here as well. Um, and you can ask him, at the age of like 11, I think I declared my favorite book was The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, which for a little white girl in Color Springs is slightly strange looking through these identity politics, right? Why does the blue-eyed, you know, blonde at the time girl so moved by Toni Morrison's work? So I think, obviously, I had a different experience than, than you know, a young black girl who was reading that at the same time would have had. But I think... I think there's all of these entry points. And I think one of the kind of elephants in the room around this conversation is like white women have to deal with white privilege if we're ever going to have, if we are going to show up to these meetings and if we are going to have these conversations. So that's, I mean, that's such an undone piece of this whole conversation is the majority of us who grew up with white privilege still don't even know how to talk about that, how to think about it. Um, from my generation, we grew up listening to hip hop music, so that complicates. I mean, there's just this whole huge to my mind, very unhad conversation about white privilege that needs to happen in order for that piece of it to get done. 
Yeah, I was going to just mention the post-racial um, moniker that I hate very much because I think it it lets us off the hook as a society about things that we have not talked about and that we um, are not usually brave enough to talk about um, outside of our, our circles of power and privilege and, and influence. And so I, I think it's um, very much about having the courage to tell your story because there's not just one story and also to, to bring up stuff like white privilege and, and company to have a conversation about it. But there, there just aren't that many opportunities across races and genders, I don't think, to, to have those authentic kind of conversations. Mm -hmm. Perez, you were gonna say something? Yeah, I just add that, you know, I think part of the core of this is that an intersectional feminism is a decentralized feminism, because it's really hard to think about an intersectional feminism with like one leader, right? Because that one leader, unless they happen to embody every, you know, they're never gonna embody every single piece of the identities that people bring, right? So um, for me, I feel like the way to, to centralize different communities' um, voices and perspectives is to bring feminism to those communities and to those movements, right? So, and this is a debate I've had with kind of prominent older feminists a lot, is like, what work is feminist work? Can you do, immigration work and do it as a feminist. And I think feminism, immigration work can be feminist. And the key is bringing the gender analysis to the immigration work, right? And so in that way, then you're no longer just sort of um, centralizing the experience of necessarily white, you know, cisgender straight feminist women, but you're bringing feminism to immigration work, which inherently has these roots and all these different movements. So I feel like that's the struggle. The media wants to see a centralized feminism with, a, with one leader and everybody rallying with the same sign saying this is what a feminist looks like, but actually feminism is infiltrating in all these different movements across class and race and sort of issue boundaries. And so we don't know how to see it in the same way, but I think it's there if we look for it and that's a success of, of sort of intersectional feminism kind of bringing it away from this one central piece about you know, gender, you know, pay equity or whatever the, the key central feminist issue was. You know, so. And we've also at Feministing struggled with this in like super practical ways because we are technically a collective, but um, the two white cisgendered women, myself and Jessica Valenti, are the ones who get the majority of media calls, get the majority of like speaking opportunities at this point. Um, and so we've tried a lot to figure out like how do we buck this system? Because even when we would say to CNN like I'm actually not the right person to talk about that to Perez is writing about birth politics and and far more of an expert on it than I am. We find that they're reluctant because they they know they're like this is their paradigm is like the young pretty white feminist girl talking about feminism. So one of the things we tried to do is declared Samita uh, Mukhopadhyay the executive editor of feministing, and she actually has taken this leadership role because she's like totally badass and amazing, but that wasn't our intention. Initially we were like, let's give her this title that the rest of the world understands as like the leader, and then when they call we can say, actually, you should interview the executive editor, and then they're like, oh yes, put us on the phone with the exec, thank you, you know? <laughs> so, so, I mean, and it hasn't been terribly effective, I have to admit, even on that level, but, um, but it's interesting, I mean, it comes down to even like the most practical things for us of trying to be so conscious of it that we can figure out how to even like manipulate outsiders' perspectives of what, what a feminist looks like, et cetera. So it's, it's complicated. Yes? I think that, um, I mean, in addition to men doing the laundry, which is fantastic if that's what they want to do, um, I think that more and more you are seeing women within the movement understanding that the involvement of men is so crucial. Um, and I mean, the, the thing that most keeps me awake at night and, and make, makes me 
sure that I need to call myself a feminist and claim that word. For me personally, it's around the area of sexual violence, sex trafficking, all of these issues. And you know, it's like you go to you go to a women's college, they're gonna give every woman a rape whistle a rape whistle that you can blow if someone's attacking you. That's great. But why don't we also talk about the male side of the equation and who are the men who are gonna, you know, be chasing me through Smith campus and what do we do about that? How are they raised? How, what are they taught about sexuality, about women versus men? And I mean, it's not just sexuality, of course, it's also housework and everything up and down the spectrum. Um, but I think there are a lot of incredible men's groups that have formed in the last several years that are really talking, I mean, I know Jack, there's so many, but um, Robert Jensen, who's at UT, particularly talking about pornography, he is, oh, you probably know him, right? Oh, he's such a genius. He's I want to meet him. He's, he's amazing. Um, Jackson Katz, who I think is in Boston? And he talks particularly about men in groups that you know one individual man might act very differently and think very differently than he might in a group. And so he he looks at the kind of t like stereotypically male groups, like sports teams, men in the military, fraternities, and kind of talking to them about their ideas of masculinity and, and sort of how to turn it on its head. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of particularly within sex trafficking. Um, a lot of the focus in the last few years has turned to the demand side of that equation. Who are the men? What makes them think this is okay? And, and what do we do about it? Mm -hmm. So I think that more and more men are becoming involved. And as I said, in college, I didn't think a man could call himself a feminist, but now I absolutely do. And I think it's crucial that men do. Yeah. I'd also like to throw out Byron Hurt's Beyond Beats oh, and Rhymes, so which amazing. is like an incredible documentary film about masculinity and hip hop and um, heteronormativity and a bunch of stuff. And and just add that I think one of the most interesting things from my perspective happening with male feminists is this notion of how do you, you know, try to end violence against women, which is the entry point for a lot of men into the movement. How do you get past that, keep doing that, but get to the idea that this movement is liberating for you. Like, right. it's not just about stopping violence against me. Like, you get right. to be a more realized, authentic, fulfilled human being if you're not being repressed by the notions of what appropriate masculinity is. So that, I don't feel like we're quite there in the sort of public conversation yet. Yeah, I feel like actually Gloria Steinem and Eve Ensler both in the last year I've heard say that, you know, that they are encouraging men to just picture what would it be like if you didn't have all these structures telling you this is what a boy does. You know, a yeah. boy doesn't cry, a boy likes sports, a boy, whatever it is. Like, imagine the freedom you would feel if we didn't have this sort of binary structure in place. And we do have a man in the anthology, I just wanted to say, who writes about becoming a feminist via these two wonderful, totally different things. One is his incredibly strong African-American mother and grandmother and Martha Stewart, <laughs> which like, <laughs> we were like, whoa, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, Mary. You guys want to take that? Anyone? Um, I mean, I think it's I think it's a good thing. Um, I think it's not enough. Did to everyone hear the question? So the question was about women's studies to gender studies, and a lot of a lot of campuses are also going to women and gender studies. So this idea of trying to be inclusive. I mean, this connects to the last conversation, right? Because I think I like to talk about it as feminism's gender identity crisis, right? Because I think it's both <laughs> a question of. <laughs> Think about that for a second. Um, <laughs> about the question of the role of men, but also the question of what's the role of a women's movement in today's era, right? And for young women especially, I think the, there's a less of an immediate um, relationship to a women's movement than maybe there was. And it also depends on what kind of women, woman you are, right? And what identity, identities you sort of, what labels you prioritize. Um, so I think what's happening on college campus is sort of reflective of that question of like, what's the need of a women's movement and what's the role of men? Um, in, in feminism or in like the conversation about sexism. And I think, like Courtney's saying, we're getting to this point where we understand that women are not the only ones affected by gender oppression, right? And this isn't just about women can do, you know, it isn't just about women's equality, right? It's about gender. It's sort of about how does gender affect all of us in our lives? And I think we're seeing it in the mainstream conversation now more when we're starting to see things like boys are falling behind, right? Um, which a lot of that is, you know, BS kind of use of statistics, but there are all these places in which, you know, not as many men on college campuses, you know, boys are doing worse in elementary school than girls now. And, and the he uh, session. The he session, right, and yeah, men are losing their jobs and women aren't and all that kind of stuff. But, yeah. so I, 
this idea that the recession is affecting men oh, more than women. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Session, I'm, I'm he session. But so, recession. you know, I think it's, um, <laughs> so it sort of comes, people are starting to understand that, oh wait, boys are being affected by these sort of bigger pieces of things too, right? And it's not just women's oppression, right? But that there are obviously gender differences in the way that people kind of live their lives and are, are treated and are what things they're able to do. So um, I think that it's good if we can kind of broaden our perspective to talk about how gender um, affects everyone, right? How boys are limited by gender, how girls are limited by gender, how trans folks, I mean, across the spectrum, how gender kind of structures our world and limits our world and kind of, um, you know, lays out the path for us in many ways. And so I think the problem, you know, on the college campus side is that the name might change, but as the study changing, and academics takes a long time to catch up, right? So, but I think it's important to, to both say, you know, saying it's gender studies says, does, makes it a little bit easier for a guy who wants to study it, for people not to be like, why are you a women's studies major, you know? So it makes, there's an opening for non-female identified people, um, and it also tries to reflect this, this question that it's not just about women's oppression anymore, you know, it's, it's a bigger conversation. I think and also, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think it's also important to talk about where we locate the accountability for the problem. So you, like, you can't expect the oppressed to overturn everything without the help of the oppressor changing. So the idea of doing gender studies and anti-racism studies, it's like, it's not just up to women to change the world, like, men have to be involved too, you know, so. Yeah, I was going to say something slightly off topic, which would, but it's something that you said kind of made me think this, that one of the reasons we wanted to do this book in the first place was because it's a very popular sort of media message, feminism is dead, there is no more feminism, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I, Gloria Steinem also went to Smith and I had this great opportunity to interview her for our alumni magazine. It was this long, long, long interview that probably got, got you know, condensed down to this, but I don't care because I got to hear all the answers and now I can just <laughs> regurgitate them all the time. Uh, and, you know, I had said something to her about, do you find it concerning that so few women, young women identify as feminists? And she said, compared to what? She said there was never, it was never all women <laughs> are feminists, you know, it wasn't like right. 1970 and every single woman in America is a feminist, you know. Um, so I think there's this important question which we're sort of trying to get at in this book but I also think about a lot, what does bring young women and young men to this table and, and sort of how do we do that? Courtney and I did um, an interview and we were doing some publicity for Click with Cosmopolitan, the, the website version of Cosmo, which in a way is great exposure because so many women read Cosmo, so many women who probably wouldn't identify as feminists. But at the same time, it's frustrating because you're being asked to kind of explain what this does for us. What can we get out of it? You know, yeah. like, it's frustrating. So literally, they asked, you know, this anthology full of these fascinating voices. They're like, so tell us, do you pick up the paycheck at the end of the date? Right. And I was like, really? <laughs> this is what we're going to talk about? Yeah. yeah. It's hard because you do want to infiltrate those spaces, obviously. We were very happy they were writing about it. On the other hand, it's so frustrating the quality of the kinds of engagement right. in those spaces yeah. is like, okay. Right, right, right. Uh, there, there's one in the back. I can't see your face. But. Right. That in championing their agency, I can't, you know, be against it at all. And yeah. Like, I'll never, I'll say that I won't date a guy that goes to strip clubs. But then I find myself in conversations defending women, which is fine, you know, being against slut shaming, but there seems to be, it just gets to be confusing for me. I was going to elaborate on Yeah, I yeah, think great it's, question. I, that's a really good question. And I think that this is part of what's sort of difficult about identifying yourself with a word. Um, and wishing that other people will also identify themselves with the same word and finding a sense of community with those who identify, but also sometimes there's friction. There's, this is what you think feminism is, well, this is what I think feminism is. Personally, as I said, I, I think Catherine McKinnon is a genius. I really don't believe that pornography is empowering. I don't believe that, I really don't believe in the idea of sex work. I don't believe that that's, I think, you know, in this culture, there Pornography is a more lucrative industry than Hollywood. 
So the message they have, the power to send a message that this is empowering, that this is fun, that this is whatever, is huge. It's strong. And I mean, there are probably people sitting right here with me who disagree. But yeah, <laughs> see, but you know, when you have the average age of entrance into prostitution in this country being 11 or 12 years old, I find it very hard to think of it as an empowered choice. And going back to the issue of race, um, Rachel Lloyd, who runs GEMS, who is this amazing woman, um, you know, she told me a story about how she works with young girls who are in prostitution and how... It stands for Girls Empowering Empowerment Mentoring Services. If you haven't checked it out, you should totally check it out and it's an amazing give them money and give them attention. They're yeah, amazing. they're amazing. And, you know, she told me about how Oprah had come to them and wanted them to be on the show, and so she was really excited and... Um, they said, okay, so we, and, and she has certain girls who will, you know, who are sort of trained to speak to the media and sort of savvy and in a place where they can. And they said, okay, so we want, you know, basically three white girls from suburbia. She's like, well, those aren't the girls, those aren't the girls who are trafficked into prostitution. You know, we have a lot of teenage girls who come from pretty bad family situations, most of whom are black, who grew up, you know, in Harlem, which is where she's based. Well, no, they don't want that. They want like the three girls from suburbia. And often you see the story on the news that's like, this could be your neighbor. The you know yeah. the white girl has been trafficked into. Well, it doesn't really happen. So it's hard for us. It's like when we live in a media culture that's sort of so interested in, like you said, having you you know you on the panel or you on the whatever or Rachel Lloyd's non-existent white 15-year-old prostitute who you know ended up going to Harvard or whatever. It's very frustrating because those aren't really the stories. Right. Right. Prez, do you want to jump in? We're all, we're all about respectful disagreement, so I'm glad you brought <laughs> yeah. up this question. Well, I don't, not to get into the like, dynamics of sex work and sex trafficking. I think it's, mm. it's a complicated issue that you know, feminists have disagreed about for a long time, but I think the, you know, it's, it's never simple enough. It's never we can just be anti-porn or pro-porn or anti-sex work or pro-sex work. It's really, I think it's really complicated um, based on the context, based on the people involved, based on the political situation. So that's what I think you're getting at, is that it's never, it's never easy, it's never simple. Um, and I think sometimes the, the sort of historical positions, feminist positions have been too simple and too um, sort of like blanket, like, you know, we're totally anti this and we're totally anti that and this is always, always oppressive to women, period, ever, you know? And mm -hmm. so it's not that simple. Our lives are not that simple. We live in a capitalist system. Um, we can't avoid that, you know? So. I think that's the challenge: is trying to have a nuanced position on some of these issues. That it really matters what you know, what region you're talking about, what people you're talking about, and the context of it. And um, and I find that the the sort of black and white positions are just it's, it's too simple, you know. So um, I think that's the challenge: is is both sitting you know in a in a room of feminists and knowing that you disagree vehemently with someone about a big issue like you know this one of, of porn and sex work or another issue you know and still feeling like well we're, we still have something in common and then to take a bigger extreme example right it's like sarah palin is a feminist right and like what does that mean to share so there's there's i think there's bigger questions about who is a feminist even now that are that we're asking that are even bigger than these sort of like more nuanced disagreements about certain issues it's like our whole feminist platform is sort of being co-opted and what it, you know who gets to do that? So I think it's a, it's a challenge, and not you know I'm going to answer for it. Camille Pagny has said that, that she was a that Sarah Palin's a feminist. Yes, yeah, she awesome. said she in, in an article talking about Camille her, Pagny, um, who who many mm -hmm. feminists don't think is a feminist, but yeah, she calls herself a pro sex, pro art, pro beauty feminist. Camille, and, yeah. But so she said Sarah's a, a and feminist. She, and then she named after naming Madonna a feminist. It was in the context of naming Madonna a feminist, and then now is moving forward and saying, yes, I see Sarah Palin as a feminist. So, which is interesting because she is herself. Right. So it's this question, are we gonna draw a line in the sand and say, if you're on this side, you're a feminist. If you're not, you're, you're, um, you're not, you know? And what issues would be in that line? And like, I don't, I don't know, you know, I, I doubt we could come to agreement on that, right? It'd be really hard. Well, I'd even like to bring it back to the womanist feminist question that Hushinda raised, because I think that that's a really interesting one. I mean, at this point, are you, like, you said you don't see the word womanist used regularly. Do you wanna, do you wanna see it used regularly? Do you wanna be someone who uses it regularly? Like how? How do you interact with those terms at this point? I mean, I think it's complicated because I'm a person who resists labels. I don't like boxes, right? And I think that most feminists or most, most people who, um, who would consider themselves feminists or womanists are like that. They, they are complex and then, so they resist being in a box, but you can't build community by being individual in that way, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. So you can't really have an alliance or a movement where you're saying I resist being you know, associated or affiliated with you 
by the use of this word. At the same time, I think it's important to not, um, it's like living in a colorblind society or a post-racial society. That is the ideal, right? We would like to, to, to not necessarily um, uh, uh, discriminate or classify people specifically according to race or um, color, but at the same time, when you do that, you, uh, you make them sort of this monotonous group of people where mm -hmm. you don't see any difference at all. And that's not the point. So if you don't right. see the difference, then we can't have a conversation because you don't know what's different about me and, and how it makes me feel that you don't see me mm -hmm. if you just call me a feminist. If I could be something else and also be in allegiance with you, if we agree and we overlap in some places, then that's a really powerful place to come from. So mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't necessarily call myself a womanist or a feminist. I try to live my life as a womanist, as someone who you know both appreciates and loves the feminism and the work that it does, and also can can see where um, Audre Lorde and other you know and Alice Walker and other people have been at the margins of feminist work and this idea of a movement where you know black women were just kind of you know we always worked we always worked I mean we always worked so so feminist uh, fe feminism. Feminism as a movement became this thing about working outside of the home, mm -hmm. you know, and and so where do I fit in that? You mm -hmm. know, that there wasn't really a, a pathway that I could see. Um, and, and when I found a word, I felt like, oh, my God, like, yeah, I can totally mm -hmm. understand, you know, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. and, and it became it became my path to feminism. Right. So. Um, so, yeah. And yeah. In that way, it's not only race based, but also class based, right. which is a huge basis of all of this, because. When Betty Friedan was writing about you know the oppression of being home and having to play tennis and having a lot of women you know <laughs> white and black were saying screw you I mean I right. work my ass off what right. are you talking about yeah. you know right. not that that wasn't valid what she was writing about because for her and for a lot of other women it was but but there's a long legacy of women of all races working in this culture and many other going way way back yeah like pre Friedan right right <laughs> yeah. Brother! Mm -hmm. I have a question about that. Um, <laughs> we, were ta we were talking before about uh, having a kind of society where you have like every freedom to define your identity. You can, you don't have to worry about race, you don't have to worry about gender, everything is, you're, you're defining your own identity for yourself in every way. Um, and that's something that came up a lot in the book, especially in 60% of this group, that uh, about learning to be feminist and be Indian, learning to be feminist, and uh, to support African American rights or queer rights, or uh, and there are all these other things. It's sort of about hunting in the book, mm -hmm. yeah. and learning to not define yourself by what you're not allowed to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Do you feel like you're still kind of fighting? It's for everybody. Do you feel like you're still kind of fighting between the uh, areas where there's a clash between trying to be feminist and trying to be something else? He's my brother. I'm not answering that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it means you should have to answer I think it. That's a great question. All right. Yeah, it's a great question. Thank right. you. First of all, you read the book. Wow. I know. Oh, good job. To be fair, I know, right? <laughs> um, I, th I think it's a hard question, and I think all of this panel is really making me think about like what. Uh, like what are what are these words for? Like why is it important to be called a feminist? Like why is it important to be called these different things? The idea of intersectionality really helps. The idea that you can be lots of things at once and you experience oppression and privilege in many places at once. Um, I'm not really answering the question but though. An intersection should be like a harmonious intersection, you know? No, no, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Not the way that intersectionality is defined. I mean, um, I guess it's it's like. For me, it's about, like, having words like this is about kind of moving beyond the individual, moving to, like, the structures in society that keep you from being all of those things at once. I mean, even the question before about sex trafficking. I mean, I think the, the big point that you made in that question was, like, why aren't there other options for women, you know? Like, why, why is this considered a, a viable life choice? I mean, one of the things that I did when I was in grad school is I taught in this school for kids who were... Um, who, it was an alternative sentencing program, so these kids got sentenced to this program where they had to go to school and things like that instead of going to Rikers. These were some of the smartest kids I've ever met in my life. And for them, they had gone to prison because, you know, selling drugs on the street was more interesting and more rewarding than going to school. I mean, that's a problem. 
but there's not a school in their neighborhood that they can you know, go to and that they have these options. So for me, I think it's a lot about changing the structures that um, keep you from doing all these things at once and being all these things at once. And then also just going back to the idea of a single story, I mean, having more voices like this out there where you can proudly say, you know, I am more than one thing and the rest of the world just has to deal with it because that's who I am. Mm -hmm. So. I agree. I don't, I don't necessarily think of myself as fighting. I mean, I definitely um, do a lot of different things because I, I feel like I want to resist the classification of um, black women as being one thing or another. Um, and I, I feel like I enter spaces with the, the thought in mind that, um, that I can live what I believe instead of uh, having to, to be a part of a label or a box. At the same time, I, you know, and I actually kind of hate semantics, you know, so I mean like woman is feminist, like whatever. Like I just want to live whatever it is that I believe. At the same time, I think that um, it's really useful because there's so much silence about expectations of women, you know, still. And, and I think that's my, my biggest fight, if there is one, is that, you know, there, there's silence around, you know, um, uh, women who resist being mothers, women who resist being wives, um, and if you don't do that, then you're basically not normal still. I, I mean, and, and now that I'm 32, I know this because, you know, most of my friends are getting married and having babies, and I don't judge them for that, but they, there is judgment in the other direction, so, and, and to me, that's still problematic. Anyone else? We'll do one more question. I know that's always a lot of pressure to be the last question, but... <laughs> No one can. feels. All right. Um, I've got to think about how I'm afraid to say this. <laughs> okay, we talked about sex trafficking at a certain point, and we talked about pornography at a certain point. And one of the things I've been curious about my parents are from Africa. So I come from a history that sits out of, outside of the slave history in America. But one of the things that fascinates me is I often wonder if the debates around, let's say, selling bodies in America. How does one ever trust themselves having a debate around selling bodies when you come from a history of selling human beings that hasn't been talked about mm -hmm. in any real, clear way? What do you mean, how do you trust? Well, Unpack so that we'll idea have, for me. We'll have conversations, we'll have conversations about sex work, right. or we'll have conversations about pornography, but we forget that we come from a society that at some point went into other societies, be it Native American societies, mm -hmm. African societies, plucked human beings out from those societies, pulled them into this society, mm -hmm. sold them as chattel, breeded them, made family and, and intimacy and everything totally devoid of meaning, not just for those people, but for the people who inflicted it upon them. Mm -hmm. Now we come to this stage without ever having clearly ever worked that out. It just becomes very hard for me to imagine trusting myself, saying, well, sex work, I think it, 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 someone should be able to sell their body that way. Mm -hmm. Coming from that particular history mm -hmm. that doesn't seem like it ever gets dealt with or comes up in the conversation much. Like these conversations happen Native American being mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do we even know we have the right to be having some of these conversations? Mm. I think a lot, oh, can I start that? Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a deep question that's big, so I'm gonna try to get to it a little bit. I mean, I think a lot of the ways in which you see, especially, um, well, it's mostly young girls in prostitution, it, there's this shocking, um, and you can totally disagree with me if you want to tell, say so. But in, in my opinion, there are these shocking similarities to exactly the way that slavery occurred. I mean, a lot of these girls are branded by their pimps, for example, so that you know who the owner of the girl is. I mean, that to me is a direct thing. That's from slavery. Um, recently, I was in uh, Nashville for a book conference. And this was a very bad idea, but my boyfriend and I were at Best Buy, for goodness sakes. And on the way back, we're driving, and there's Andrew Jackson's homestead. You can go do a tour. So I'm like, hmm, that might be interesting. Let's go do that. It was one of the most disturbing and upsetting things I've ever seen in my life, because here was this president of our country, and he was one of the most massive slaveholders at that time. And the way in which they describe him as a slaveholder, even now, is so 
creepy. Has anyone ever been there? Do not go. <laughs> it's like innocuous. <laughs> they also charge a bloody fortune. So yeah. he's, his family's still kind of making money off slavery. I mean, they have a hayride you can do of the frickin' slave court. I could talk about this for like a whole other panel, but, um, but even the descriptions of like, he was kind of paternal to everyone around him, his slaves and his children. He, you know, he um, was, could be very harsh. For example, if he thought a slave had done something bad, he might take their child away and sell them to someone else that they never saw. Them. But he could also be very warm and paternalistic. It's like, what? No, no, no. Those two things can't <laughs> coexist. Hold up. And when you, some of the girls who, were, who Rachel Lloyd has helped, um, out of prostitution, I interviewed quite a few of them when I worked for Bob Herbert at the Times, and they would describe to me the men who pay for sex. And, you know, the men run the gamut from married men to single men to, but this one girl talked about this frequent customer she has who will come in and show her photographs of his children, like, and his wife. I mean, she's a child herself, you know, but, but his mentality is like, I pay for this, therefore I, I get it. And there's something to me very disturbing and very direct about the connection between slavery in this country and the way that sex trafficking occurs in this country. I think it's like, it's our modern day form of slavery. I mean, that's what it is. And around the world, not just in this country. I mean, I think, you know, I feel like I have to defend myself because you're, it's sort of, I, because I didn't clarify, like it sounds like I'm, you know, for the sex trafficking of like 11 year old girls. <laughs> <laughs> right? that's, so that's the thing, I, mean, I think, you know, the point is, right, one thing is like, what we believe in theory and like what we think should happen in theory and the other part is the reality of the life that we live or not that we live but that people live right and the realities of our world our capitalist system our history of slavery and kind of how that plays out and so i think the the disconnect for me sometimes is the theoretical beliefs of like what should and shouldn't happen and what girls and women and people should and shouldn't do with their bodies and what the realities of their lives are like your example about rikers you know i think there's a reason why those kids um, you know, why they're selling drugs rather than going to school and does the criminalization of the drug trade and the, the fact that they were criminalized themselves for selling drugs do anything to change this reality, right? And so I think that's part of where I come down has to do with this idea of criminalization and how criminalization affects both the girls and women who do sex work um, and whether it improves their situation at all. I think that's sort of a piece of it has to do with criminalization. So I'm not, you know, condoning the sort of sex trafficking industry, obviously, but I think there's there's points in which, again, the nuance is lost in our sort of theoretical attempts at saying this is what's okay and this is what's not versus what's the reality. And I think an example that I've written, written about recently that sort of brings us up in a, in a less extreme way is this idea of surrogacy, which is a, a kind of not very talked about debate, but it's something that um, is really kind of coming into more fore as the, the science and the technology change and has an international piece with sort of India being a very center of the surrogacy kind of market. Um, and even you know places like California and Washington State trying to legalize surrogacy in certain contexts. And so again, it's these, it brings up these questions about the market and like women's bodies and what's okay. And even when you can, when you believe that there's consent, when someone is an adult who is consenting to do something like, for example, carry a child for someone else, when is it okay and when is it not okay? And, and I mean, there's absolutely no consensus, feminist or otherwise, around this issue. So again, I feel like for me, it comes down to like what's theoretically, what we would believe we would want in a theoretical beautiful universe where everyone gets to choose and has access to lots of types of employment and then what is the reality of the not at all ideal world we live in that's completely um, stratified based on race and class and um, what's best for kind of improving those conditions while that's the reality of it. So that was sort of <laughs> lofty. No, that I makes totally a lot of sense. That. Makes I a totally lot of agree sense. with that. I think Either of you want to tackle oh, it. I was just going to say one thing. If you want to think, if you want to look at it, an amazing model in terms of the legalization, dealing with prostitution, I think the Swedish model is absolutely incredible in which um, the women are not uh, ever dealt with in a legal way except given sort of services, but the the pimps and the johns, johns are the ones who are prosecuted. Which is not what happens in the United States at all. No, I mean, it's so the opposite. In fact, you know, in New York, I mean, now we have the Safe Harbor Act. I don't know if that's made a big difference, but before that, it was, it was like a, a much lesser crime to be selling a woman on the street than selling drugs on the street. So, you know, a lot of, of men who had been brought in for drugs once or whatever, they turned to pimping because it's like, it's a lesser crime, it's not, and also it's a hidden crime. I mean, especially now with Craigslist and all of this stuff that most of the pimps are not on the street, the girls are. So they're the ones who end up criminally responsible. So I think the Swedish model is interesting to look at if you're interested. 
Any final words? You know, I actually don't know that much about sex trafficking, so I don't feel comfortable talking about it. But I, but I will say that, again, not to go on a tear about the post-racial word, but I do think that part of that, that discussion and that narrative since Obama became president has, has um, sort of silenced pe uh, people around slavery. And I think that the, the narrative basically now is we have a black president so we don't have to talk about slavery anymore or that it's not permissible for black people to consider it um, a legacy of, of cattle, being cattle in this country. And so um, that's part of the reason why actually I hate it such, so much because I feel like it completely obscures the conversation and represses it um, when it comes to the sexualization of black bodies in, in America specifically. And so I think the only way you can ever trust any kind of narrative that you see around black bodies in America is if, if you investigate the source of those narratives and, and determine whether or not you trust them to, to, uh, to accurately and authentically reflect that story um, and to contextualize any other kind of trafficking that you see. Any other? We're good here. Um, yeah, and I would just say to kind of bring it together as we're closing here that I think one of the things you're talking about is this sort of amnesia about what has gone on, but also an invisibility about what is going on right now as we all sit in this pristine atmosphere of the Brooklyn Museum. So um, part of the most radical work of feminism is getting those narratives, not the post-racial bootstrap narrative, not the you know women don't need feminism anymore because everything's equal narrative, but the narratives that, that honor our, our histories both incredibly disturbing and beautifully positive and kind of bring those threads with us as we continue to do this work. So it's, it's a heavy legacy we got on our backs up here, but um, I think that's part of the effort of this anthology is to give people uh, some more narratives. And I hope there are many more anthologies like this that reflect even more voices that I see emerging and really shaping how people think about what feminism is or could be, um, the kind of lives we can all lead liberated from our um, specific identity boxes. Um, as Hoshinda puts it. So thank you so much for being here. A quick note, um, I wrote a book called Do It Anyway, The New Generation of Activists. There are postcards up here if anyone's interested. Um, Perez, do you want to explain a little bit about this postcard? It's just an anthology coming out in the spring that I have a piece in called Persistence. Awesome. Check it out. With a really awesome cover. So um, please come up and grab postcards. Thank you so much for being here. You guys have been really awesome. <laughs> So thank, thank you all very, very much for coming. This concludes our program.